Good evening. On behalf of the International Film Festival Rotterdam and the Dutch Photo Museum, welcome at this lecture of the renowned artist Alfredo Jaar. We are so honored he is here tonight. My name is Brigitte Donker and I'm the director of the Dutch Photo Museum just across the street. And if you haven't been there recently, go there tomorrow. Because we have a show, a very powerful show, made by Alfredo Jaar. I have the honor to introduce him before giving him the floor. Alfredo Jaar is a visual artist, originally from Chile. And he is trained as an architect and as a filmmaker. And as he often says, I'm an architect. And that gives me an enormous amount of freedom as an artist. Alfredo Jaar lives in New York, but he travels most part of the year, all over the world, world, wherever his work takes him. The work of Alfredo Jaar is usually politically motivated, always committed and engaged. And here I would like to quote him. I think all art is socially conscious. There is no alternative. Perhaps his best known work is the six year long project, the Rwanda project, about the 1994 Rwanda genocide. And this exists of 21 pieces. And he once called it his most difficult work. He also has made numerous public interventions, like a logo for America uh, on Times Square, and the cloud a performance project on both sides of the Mexican-US border, involving the release of 3,000 balloons into the air. And of course, there is this very impressive monument he made in Santiago de Chile, the Geometry of Conscious, a memorial for the victims of the Pinochet military rule. Alfredo Jaar is currently working on what he calls a trilogy of light, three installations, each focusing on one single image. And he feels that we have lost our cap capacity to see. We are numbed by the images that surround us. And that is why Alfredo Jaar invites us to stop and really look at one image. The first part of this trilogy was called The Sound of Silence. The second part, Shadows, is now showing in the photo museum and it focuses on a picture of Dutch photographer Koen Wessing. And Alfredo Jaar describes this photo as one of the most impressive images of grief I've ever seen. I would like to round up by mentioning Alfredo Jaar is also part of the jury of the International Film Festival. And he just told me that all his five colleagues are here in the room. And this is the second uh, year he gives a lecture here. And people who have attended his lecture last year are still impressed. So this is very promising. Uh, and finally, I would say, I'd like to say that uh, the lecture will last about one and a half hour. And he's not going to take any questions in the end. Please give a big applause to Alfredo Jaar. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you for coming. I'm honored by your presence. There are so many extraordinary films out there, so I'm really thankful that you're here instead of watching another film. Um, how do we make art when the world is in such a state? How do we make art when we are surrounded by information that most of us would rather ignore? I don't know, and that is why I'm an artist. According to Chinua Achebe, a great Nigerian writer that I deeply admire, art is our constant effort to change the order of reality that was given to us. To change the order of reality. How do we do that? I don't know, and that's why I'm an artist. And as an artist, the methodology I use is the one from the architect, meaning I have to respond to the context. And I have to understand the context before acting. 
So the modus operandi I've always used is that I will not act in the world before understanding the world. And so I have to understand. I have to understand. And I have to do research and analyze and more research. And I will act only when I feel responsible, that I have the responsible knowledge before acting. That is key. I need to respond to the context in which I have to live. And the context in which we live today is one of the most difficult ones, I feel, at least for my generation. We live indeed in very dark times. There are winds of fascism all around the world, all around us. What can art do in the face of such reality? I don't know. This is the first image of my lecture. It should not be there because apparently it was triggered without my consent. This is, of course, Antonio Gramsci, the great uh, neo-Marxist thinker, philosopher, who spent most of his life in prison. He's, he's a very important thinker for me and for the resistance in Chile during the Pinochet regime. That's how I discovered him. And since then, I have not abandoned him. I've been making drawings. Can we have the lights off, please? I've been making drawings from the portrait of Antonio Gramsci, maybe one or two a day. And so I've completed maybe a thousand portraits. This one here is illustrating his most important book called Letters from Prison. Can we have, have the lights off, please? All the lights off, please. So I do one or two a day. It relaxes me. It inspires me as if I wanted to capture everything he, I learned from him. He believed that culture can affect change. And of course, his studies and his ideas, his theories about hegemony are fundamental to understand what's happening today in the world of culture. I've done also some installations where I put together some drawings. This one has 56 drawings. And why do I start with Gramsci today in these dark times? Because in December of last year, last, that means last month, the Maxi Museum in Rome invited me to do a public intervention in the city, in the streets of Rome. And I immediately thought about a sentence that Gramsci wrote almost 70 years ago. He said, the old world is dying. The new world struggles to be born. This chiaroscuro is a time of monsters. And I feel that we are here today. This is definitely the time of monsters. And monsters are emerging all around us. And we do not have the tools to stop them. We have to create new models of thinking the world. I designed two posters with the Italian version. Of course, using the colors of the Italian flag. And we place them around the city. My name is not on it. It's only Gramsci's name, of course. And during the first week, Newspapers and magazines and TV programs started talking about this campaign. They thought it was the new Communist Party. Because as you know, Gramsci founded 
the original Communist Party of Italy. He also founded the, the newspaper L'Unità, that is still running. They also thought it was a new party, it was a new com political campaign, and then finally, a week later, the museum decided to reveal the origin of the work. So I wanted to occupy a public space with this message from Gramsci. And also, I wanted to offer the possibility to carry this poster with you, so we offered it inside the museum. And so we produced thousands of them, so now they find themselves in the homes of people, and of course in social media. But I'm going to go back in history for a few seconds. On September 11, 2001, of course, there was a tragedy in New York. And I'm a New Yorker for 35 years. It was very powerful, very sad. It was a terrible tragedy. And in the next month after this, we were still afraid when we heard a plane going over the skies of New York. But to me, who was born in Chile, I immediately thought about another Tuesday, another September 11, which is the one from 1973, and the one that changed my life. That day, of course, it was a military coup of General Pinochet, that started with the bombing of La Moneda, which is the presidential palace, killed Salvador Allende, the first socially elect, elected president of Latin America. And we endured a dictatorship that lasted 17 years, courtesy of Mr. Nixon and Mr. Kissinger. This is the last image we have of Salvador Allende before he died. He was a good man. He believed he could change the world and he could change the conditions of Chile. In the streets of Santiago and Valparaíso, you can still find this graffiti. It says, El ser joven y no ser revolucionario es una contradicción hasta biológica. Which means, to be young and not to be revolutionary is almost a biological contradiction. I repeat, to be young and not to be revolutionary is almost a biological contradiction. I'm going to show images of one of the first photo reporters that went to Chile after the coup, and that was Kuhn Vessing, to which I'm doing an homage to in the photo museum right now, based on his book called Chile, September 1973. So this is the perfect reproduction of the book.
this book, this photo book from 1973, did not have a single word inside. Vessing thought that the images should speak for themselves. So that's why I remained silent while you were looking at them. I was studying architecture at the beginning of the coup. And this is how it started. acontecimiento vivo en que cruza el cielo los aviones, las balas. Es increíble que tenemos en este instante. Nosotros estamos... Precisamente en este instante el fuego se intensifica como culminando el ataque que ha debido realizarse sobre la Casa de Gobierno. Todas las personas que estén ofreciendo resistencia al nuevo gobierno deberán atenerse a las consecuencias. Toda industria, vivienda o empresa fiscal debe de poner toda actitud beligerante. Caso contrario, las Fuerzas Armadas actuarán con la misma energía y decisión con que se atacó la moneda con fuerzas de tierra y aire. Vienen nuevamente los Hockey Hunter. Se escucha salido de avión balas de todo calibre y vemos como las columnas de humo que emanan desde la moneda pasan precisamente por sobre el lugar donde estamos debido a que en estos momentos corre viento sur nosotros estamos a tres cuadras hacia el norte del palacio presidencial vemos que la calle, la calle ha quedado totalmente desolada frente a todo este tremendo ruido que hacen los disparos de tanques de tanquetas, de aviones y de almas In my first year as an architect, I discovered letra set. Letra set were these plastic letters that you use to number plans and documents, and they come in different sizes. And I love them. So one day, I decided to play with it, and I took a blackboard, and I put the date of the military coup, 11 September 73. And suddenly, as a beginning student of architecture, I was looking for symmetry, and I wanted the text to be in the center of the panel. So I needed to add something. And I thought, I'm going to add the time of the first bomb. And that's what I did. And I saved this, this panel. And this became my first work of art indicating the moment where everything changed. The second project I did, and I didn't know I was going to become an artist, I took a page from the September 73 calendar from Chase Manhattan Bank. And with letter set, after Tuesday, September 11, I changed the next day, the 12, the 13, the 14, into an 11 because I felt the coup had changed my life forever, and every day was a September 11. And I ran up until Tuesday. It was supposed to be 18, it's, it's still 11, but then I didn't have more letter set of that size, so I stopped. Later, I realized a full calendar.
So here it's done with Xerox. I basically photocopied the number 11 and cut it and very delicately replaced the date. So starting on Tuesday 11, every day is on 11. The same for October, November and December. Later I realized another version of the calendar, a single one in black with starting with September 11. I, like all my friends, we became obsessed with that day and that number. And much later, in the late 80s, I discovered in my notebooks that I had brought with me to New York that I had pages and pages with this 11, 11, 11. I needed to get out of that number, but I couldn't, so I was just writing it down with different types of density on the page. And this is approximately at that time that I changed course and I became a magician. <laughs> and I was a magician for a few years but it didn't work, I could not change my reality. And I went back to the art world. And my first project was called Studies on Happiness. If there is something worse than censorship during a military dictatorship, it is self-censorship because you have fear and you don't know where is the red line. So you test the waters and you're always fearful that you might cross that red line. So in this project, I went out in the streets and simply asked the people, are you happy? It was a kind of sociological uh, project. I felt this was perhaps the limit. And so I had friends watching from me, for me if the cops were coming and I was behind a kiosk and asking people to vote and tell me their answers. And we moved frequently from location to location because of fear. So I asked them estimate a percentage of happy people in the world or estimate the percentage of happy people in Chile. And then finally, are you happy? And I was asking them to vote with a mint and not to fear people away. I would sim simply say, listen, if you don't want to vote, that's okay, you can have the mint, eat it. So some people ate their mint and others voted. Then, encouraged by the lack of reaction from the military, I did the second phase of this project. Portraits of happy and unhappy people. So this is happy number 31, with questions and portraits during the questionnaire and some basic information. This is unhappy number 58. Then, since there was such a lack of reaction from the military, I felt more encouraged and I just kept going. These are public presentations of happy and unhappy people. So we had a schedule and at a certain time, they would show up and sit and saying, I'm unhappy and I'm happy, and they just expose themselves as human beings. And in the meantime, we played the interview that I had done previously with them on a, on a monitor. This was the only TV we had at home, a black and white TV, so my parents didn't have television for quite a long time. And so we recorded everything. And after a while, of course, people started asking questions and a very tense exchange occurred. 
this is a photograph taken during the exchange. If you look at their faces, you will see that everyone is afraid that there's a spy among us ready to denounce us to the military. Then I went into the streets without fear and asked the question everywhere around the city. On the way to the airport, in the popular barrios, in the highway, next to the news of the world, next to the time, next to a garbage can. Are you happy? And parallel to that, I had an installation in the museum offering people the possibility to come and sit and answer that question and again be recorded live on this monitor. So for me, even if no one would sit there, it was just the concept of offering that space of freedom to say what you feel, to say what you think. This is me trying the set before starting. So I thought I would create a portrait of the people of Chile and I would get thousands of portraits in those difficult times. I would say 80% of the people remain silent. Just watch the camera, they saw themselves on the monitor. That's enough for me, that says it all. Some people read poems, some people spoke, but the image was not visible. I'm gonna show you a couple of more works before we move on from Chile. This is a newspaper clip from the new lo local newspaper. It says Telecomunicación. Mujeres en Belfast, Irlanda del Norte, practican el antiguo ritual de golpear la calle con tapas de tarros de basura para comunicar la noticia de la muerte de Thomas McElwee, otro de los huelguistas de hambre de Lira en la prisión de Mays. Telecomunicación. Women in Belfast, Northern Ireland, practice the, practice the of the IRA in the prison of Mays. So I was struck by this image. I found it fascinating that these women would have the symbol of banging down the street. And so what I did, I, I purchased six garbage cans and I used only the covers and I went down to the streets of Santiago and place them in different locations as a sign of death. And I was thinking if the cops stopped me and asked me, what are you doing? I was going to say, well, I'm a photographer. I'm, I like these white shapes on the ground, the reflection of the light, you know, some kind of abstract response. So I was stopped three times, but they were convinced my, by my explanation. And so I could do it everywhere I wanted. So for me, this was a sign of death in the landscape of Santiago. This is how far I could go. 
but of course the work is completed only when when I show them with the clip from the newspaper then people would understand that this is how it is shown so every installation has its own clipping repeating the same image but then I needed to go further and because of the censorship my father was subscribing to many publications coming from around the world and most of them would would go through the censorship and so in a French magazine there was this reportage about about Nicaragua from Susan Maicelas and I saw this image that blew me away it shows a scene of war, of devastation. And in the middle of the scene, you have this man playing clarinet. So I decide to use that symbol to express my anger, my rage, my, my sadness about the military regime. And so I did a, a performance that was recorded on this prehistoric tape. It's called Opus 1981, Andante Desesperato Performance. Inspirar fuertemente, soplar fuertemente en un clarinete y repetir proceso hasta agotamiento total. Inhale deeply and exhale deeply in a clarinet and repeat the process until total exhaustion. And so today it's shown like this in, a, in an old monitor with a photograph of the tape and the original image from Susan Maicelas. Put it loud, So obviously I didn't know how to play a clarinet, but I just wanted to express my, ra my rage making sound. And one day, much later, a friend of mine, musician, told me, Alfredo, you know why you're doing this very strange sound? It's because you have it in reverse in your mouth. And if you're curious about the hairstyle, <laughs> I can assure you it was very, very fashionable at the time. <laughs> Finally, I, I received my degree as an architect and I decided to move out of Chile. I was suffocated by the dictatorship. And I decided to do a last project. And it consisted of dividing Chile, which is a very long and narrow country. I divided the country in half with thousands of flags that would go from the Chilean flag from the mountains to the sea. This was a way of, for me to comment on the, the civil war that was about to happen because the two sides, the pro-Pinochet sides and the anti-Pinochet, would just not touch, uh, talk to each other. So for me, the country was in a crisis of identity and was about to, to commit suicide because of the lack of dialogue between the two sides. So I went with my friends from architecture. I knew very few people from the so-called art world. And, and we did this project and we photographed it and until they reached the sea. And there you will see this image of committing suicide going into the water. This was my way to say goodbye to Chile. And that's why I've been for 35 years living somewhere else. When I moved to New York, finally no censorship. And the first thing I did, I wanted to look at images of the, the, the coup. Because of the censorship, we could not see them. We were in, in, in the house under uh, the uh, curfew, so we didn't see anything, and the TV was showing us military propaganda. So I started buying old magazines from September 73, 
to look at what happened. I found a lot of French magazines and Spanish magazines. And the first work I did with that material was uh, a project called Faces. And in Faces, basically, I had a, an image from a magazine. And I would take out a blow up of one of the faces inside that group photo. And I felt that their faces would say everything we need to know about the dictatorship. For example, this man is here in the stadium where thousands of people were detained and, and finally killed. And so it's just a question of looking at his face, and he knows he's, he's going to die. All the sadness of this young man. This is the, the burial of uh, Pablo Neruda, who died a week after the coup. There are some extraordinary images that Kuhn Vessing took of this event, and they are in the museum right now. For example, this little girl is, is buried here in, in that picture. You don't really see her, but when you blow her face, then She's there on the, on the right side, the third from the right. But when you, you focus on her, then suddenly you see the sadness, the immense sadness. And of course, I discovered that Mr. Kissinger had financed the coup. And the United States was once again responsible, in part, in great part, for what was happening to us. So I became obsessed with him, and I did a series of projects about him. And I put them together inside a project that I called the Kissinger Project. This is what he said in 1969. Latin America is not important. Nothing important can come from the South. History has never been produced in the South. The axis of history runs from Moscow via Bonn and Washington to Tokyo. Henry Kissinger, June 69. So here I just uh, had a, a sheet of paper. I, I, I typed. As you can see, this is not computer, it's typed. And then I just made a hole on the paper as if we don't exist. Then I started getting postcards from the U United Nations and around New York, and, and I sent them to friends. And with my my loved letter set, I simply wrote, searching for Kissinger. Buscando a Kissinger. And then I had the, the guts to say, arrest a Kissinger, arrest Kissinger, like in this one. Then, I realized that a lot of people want to arrest him. This is the, the cover of the Village Voice in uh, 2001. How you can arrest Henry Kissinger for, for war crimes. And they call him Manhattan's Milosevic. So I was encouraged by that. And I discovered many groups, activist groups, in the United States and around the world with the same objective. How can we arrest Kissinger and take him to The Hague, to the International Court of Justice? So in 2012, I had a major retrospective in Berlin in three exhibition spaces and museums. And my exhibition coincided with September 11. So I purchased uh, ads in the three major Berlin newspapers. And uh, we simply, uh, on September 11, 2012, and we put ads saying simply, arrest Kissinger in all the languages of the countries where he committed world crimes meaning not only Chile, but Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Vietnam, Indochina, East Timor, Greece, 
in all those languages. And I was assisted by, by an office of lawyers in Berlin that is also trying to get him. A journalist asked me, Mr. Yard, don't you think this is futile? I mean, nothing will happen. And my answer was, well, perhaps. But let's not underestimate the emotion of those victims of this killer when they see this ad and they will think that perhaps a better world is possible. That's what culture can do. We can offer a new model of thinking the world, even if it, in the end it doesn't happen. But it is out there. It exists. Well, good morning, all. committee for many years, and I have never seen anything as disgraceful and outrageous and despicable as the last demonstration that just took place about, you know, you're going to have to shut up or I'm going to have you arrested. If we can't get the Capitol Hill police in here immediately, Get out of here, you low-life scum. So, Henry, I hope you will, Dr. Kissinger, I hope on behalf of all of the members of this committee on both sides of the aisle, in fact, from all of my colleagues, I'd like to apologize for allowing such uh, disgraceful behavior towards a man who served his country with the greatest distinction. I apologize profusely. This was a beautiful action from Code Pink, a group of activists that I, activists that I deeply admire. But at the end of this little video, I couldn't resist pointing out to another criminal this is, of course, Secretary of State uh, Madeleine Albright, who is in part responsible for the Iraq war that left a million people dead, innocent people. And uh, in the last 30 years, I've done many small films, and they're all films called uh, films on monstrosity, short films on monstrosity. And I dedicated one to her that I would like to share with you. They are very short, just three minutes. Can you put the, the sound level higher, please?
we have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. It is a moral question, but the moral question is even a larger one. Don't we owe to the American people and to the American military and to the other countries in the region that this man not be a threat? We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. It is a moral question, but the moral question is even a larger one. Don't we owe to the American people and to the American military and to the other countries in the region that this man not be a threat? We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. It is a moral question, but the moral question is even a larger one. Don't we owe to the American people and to the American military and to the other countries in the region that this man not be a threat? As we know, a million people were killed, innocent people. There was no threat, there were no weapons of mass destruction. And now the United States controlled the oil from Iraq. And uh, yesterday on Fox News, I, I watched a segment about Venezuela and history is repeating itself. Let me show you this. We want everybody to know we're, we're looking at all this very seriously. We don't want any American businesses or investors caught by surprise. They can see what President Trump did yesterday. We're following through on it. Uh, so if you think of a company like Sitco, which is owned by PDVSA, which is the state-run oil company there in Venezuela, we have a lot of those Sitco assets right here in the U.S. Is that something, for example, sir, that you're looking at? Yeah, well, we're in conversation with major American companies now that are either in Venezuela or in the case of Citgo here in the United States. Uh, I think we're trying to get to the same end result here. You know, uh, Venezuela is one of the three countries I call the Troika of Tyranny. It'll make a big difference to the United States economically if we could have American oil companies really invest in and, and produce the oil uh, capabilities in uh, Venezuela. It'd be good for the people of Venezuela. It'd be good for the people of the United States, we both have a lot at stake here, making this come out the right way. During the uh, government of Michel Bachelet, uh, a woman, socialist president of Chile, she, I was invited to create a memorial for the victims of the Pinochet regime. And I did it here in, uh, next to the Museum of Memory and Human Rights in the plaza facing the museum. 
This is a museum where the history of the coup is told. And the memorial is outside before, you can visit before or after you enter the, the museum. You have to go down some stairs. It's called La Geometria de la Conciencia, the geometry of conscience. And when you reach a plateau six meters below, you enter a square space that has nothing. It's only concrete walls and very little light. And there is someone welcoming you and gives you some instructions and will enter the door uh, of the memorial. And when you enter, you find yourself in full darkness for 30 seconds and in silence. And as you get adjusted to the darkness, slowly the light will start running and thousands of silhouettes will emerge out of the darkness. And, and slowly you will realize that these silhouettes are surrounded by mirrors all around you multiplying these silhouettes into infinity. The silhouettes belong to two types of people. People who were victims of the Pinochet regime that were killed, that we call the missing people, the los desaparecidos, and others that are still alive, that uh, anonymous people that I photographed in the, uh, the streets of Santiago. So they are half and half. And so the logic here was that I wanted to mix the living and the dead in the, inside this memorial. With the permission of the families, we obtained the, the portraits of the, of the victims, like Dignaldo, Herminio, Araneda, Pizzini, and we just created the outline, and we removed the face, and this is where the light is coming from. And we did the same with Jenny and Luis, and Santiago, Elizabeth, Hector, Jorge, Elsa, Rafael, Antonio, Marta, Jacqueline, Maria, Victor, Raul. So here, I wanted to create a monument for all Chile, for all Chileans. Because I have the impression these memorials that we create are for only for the victims in order to get rid of them. Here I wanted them to be in a space with us, with the living. And to create a collective narrative and to suggest that only together, with the families of the victim, we can move on. And after um, an experience of three minutes, facing this very strong light, suddenly the light will go off and the after image effect will, will create the fact that you will see these silhouettes in your retina for a long time and that's when the doors open and you leave. La Geometría de la Conciencia in Santiago. Let's go now to Buenos Aires. This is La Casa Rosada, which is a presidential palace. Argentina, of course, went through the, a very long military uh, dictatorship too. But instead of the 4,000 victims that we had in Chile, they had almost 30,000 victims. And memory is still alive in Argentina. In Chile, it's almost uh, gone. People has really tried to turn the page, but Argentinians are still fighting for justice. And uh, the, the well-known mothers of the Plaza de Mayo are still uh, doing uh, their Sunday ritual of going to the square to demand the, look, the, the, the status of, of, of their loved ones. This is a movement that started almost 40 years ago. And you can still see posters on the streets of Buenos Aires, even newspaper ads, people asking for their, their loved ones. I mean, this man disappeared in, in 1977, and they are still putting ads. It's quite extraordinary, the, the tenacity, the, the will of finding out what happened. 
and, uh, and they have been using lately a new device, which is uh, DNA exams to people uh, in their 40s and 50s, people that were born during the dictatorship. Because it is a well-known fact that a lot of uh, pregnant women activists were killed uh, during the, the military uh, uh, dictatorship. But before, they, they, they got their kids and, and they were adopted by military families. So they want to find these kids that don't know that their parents are not really their parents. And so hundreds of them have been discovered. And one of the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo recently, for example, discovered this young man who is a musician who thought his parents were his parents and they were not. They were just militaries that had stolen them from his mother. In any case, I was invited to do a memorial in the Parque de la Memoria in Buenos Aires, which is a huge park with a very big wall that has spaces for all 30,000 names. And so these walls do a very large zigzag in front of the river where bodies were thrown with, by the military from helicopters with weight on their feet. People like Francisco Juan, 28, or Omar Jose, 19, or Blanca Susana, 25. Eduardo Juan, Alberto Jorge, Estela Beatriz. For example, the third one here is Marta Inés Vacaro, 22 años embarazada, 22 years old, pregnant. So they're looking for the kids of these women that were killed, but before that they stole their children. So I created a memorial, and for that I was searching for a location that would be unknown to anyone. And I select this location. And in here, underground, we build a concrete cube, a concrete space. And so I'm going to show you the schematics since it cannot be photographed. And we connect that cube with a, that space with a, a small tube that would go out to the surface that would throw a little light inside the cube. And there, we covered it with uh, some plexiglass so there was no dirt coming down. And we installed a, a, a camera, a video camera, that would be shooting at one corner of that concrete space 24 hours a day, here. And so, as part of my exhibitions about my, my Chile works in this small museum, inside the Parque de la Memoria, we created the memorial called Punto Ciego which means a blind spot. And so you enter the space, it's a space of darkness that becomes darker and darker, and then finally you get to a space that's completely dark, and there is a huge monitor on the floor. And the monitor is showing you inside that cell. I've put these lines for you to, to imagine the, the structure of the space. And so people come and simply sit and watch this empty space, and they watch the light changing. This is the blind spot of the Argentinian memory, because out of the 30,000, there are still 15,000 missing, and they just don't know where they are. And so people spend sometimes hours seated there, just looking at this empty space, imagining their loved ones somewhere waiting and waiting. It's, it's quite horrendous. A blind spot in Buenos Aires. This, this first part of my lecture focused on, on early works. I've, I haven't shown these works for a long time. I, it was quite something to do that now. And so now I'm going to move to the most recent works. Uh, there are just a few, three or four. I want to show what, you what I've been doing now. But this was a way to connect my early work with what's happening now in the photo museum.
in Japan, every year on August 6th at 8.15 in the morning, the country commemorates Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the first time a country is bombed by nuclear bombs. This is a ceremony that took place in Hiroshima. And sadly, on March 11, 2011, the nuclear nightmare came back to Japan. That day, at 2 p.m. 46 minutes and 23 seconds, there was an earthquake. It was degree 9 in the Richter scale. It lasted six minutes. And the waves that came after the earthquake were 40 meters high. 15,833 people lost their lives instantly. 2,667 were wounded, and 6,145 were missing. And the name Fukushima became a synonym for nuclear uh, tragedy similar to Hiroshima or Nagasaki. And this is because there was a nuclear plant in Fukushima, and these are the four reactors. And the first to be hit was one of the reactors in Fukushima that started leaking 350 tons of nuclear water into the system. And these engineers are here trying to stop the leak. Outside, the, the radiation temperature is 1,000% higher than normal. And after the destruction of the, cake, the quake came the tsunami. I was invited to create a memorial, another memorial for the victims of the, of the tragedy. And I, f I did four visits in order to understand before acting. And one of my trips, I, I discovered this structure that had been destroyed by the, the tsunami. And I was told that this was a small radio station from which a young woman sent a signal to the population, the community, to get out of their homes and run to the mountain because the tsunami was coming. And uh, she did it with passion and she stayed longer and longer and longer because she wanted to save as many people as possible. But the tsunami came and she died in here. And so the community created this little memorial for her because the government didn't know what to do with this building. The antennas from which her voice was transmit transmitted to the community are still up. Her name was Miki Endo. I tried to survey the damage and uh, the tragedy. I looked around everywhere. I spoke with politicians, with artists, with intellectuals, with journalists, and I visited five refugee camps, which had been installed very quickly, very efficiently by, by the Japanese military. And at the time, they were housing 15,000 people. They were very, very efficient, but very desolate, very sad places. It was very moving to walk in between these alleys and, and see how people was trying to recreate some of the joy of life that they had before, like their gardens, their fruit. But the, the solitude was intolerable. I also ran into photographs, photographs destroyed by the tsunami that had gone away from the homes of their owners everywhere, and I collected them. Photographs of people I don't know and that I will never know, and I don't even know if they are alive. And memorials, memorials everywhere. The main newspaper of Fukushima was destroyed by the tsunami, but the journalists wanted to keep working, wanted to keep the community together. So they started writing their news on large sheets of paper in, a, in an adjacent office, and they posted these things outside. That was a, for, a way for them to keep 
the journal going, the newspaper going. If you visit their new offices, you will find a record of, of these moments. This is particularly uh, uh, sad. This is a list of the, of the places around Fukushima and the number of people still missing. In one of my visits, I, I was taken to a school that had been destroyed. And I learned that here, a lot of the students had died because they were misinformed and they stayed put instead of flying to the mountain. So that, that, that uh, story touched me deeply and I, and I went back two times to visit the school. I wanted to be alone in that huge space. And in my second visit, very early in the morning, I suddenly realized that in the former classrooms, you could still see the blackboards. And I thought, these blackboards, they are precious. This is where the kids had their gaze during thousands of hours of their life. This is where they projected their image of the world. This is where they, they created the new world. They contain the gaze of these kids. So I, I estimated that the kids who died in the tsunami had spent 15,000 hours of their lives looking at these blackboards. And so I decided to do the project around this this idea of the blackboard that contained those gazes. And the project is called Umashimankana, which is an old Japanese word that means we shall bring forth new life. And I dedicate it to Sadako Kurihara, which is a, an extraordinary Japanese poet and nuclear anti-nuclear activist who was born in Hiroshima and was in Hiroshima when the bomb fell and she survived and that night, she helped her neighbor, a young woman, give birth to a child. And the next morning, exhausted and happy because she gave life to that child, she wrote this poem, Umashimenkana, we shall bring forth new life. Insistent that even in, in, in the middle of the worst tragedies, we must bring forth new life. And so I dedicated to her and to the children of Ishinomaki of that school. And the first thing I, I did, I, I invited a, a local calligrapher, a well-known one, to write with white paint on a blackboard this word, this extraordinary word, umashimenkana. For the memorial, we darkened a very large industrial space and we installed 12 of the blackboards that were given to us by the city. We asked permission to the parents of the kids who died in that school. They accepted, but they asked me to please erase the blackboards. They didn't want to see any traces of their writing. So we photographed them first to try to capture some of these writings, but then we, we cleaned them up. 
And so they are lit with a very low level of light, inviting people to walk inside this huge dark space and to get close to these uh, blackboards that contain 15,000 hours of the gaze of these kids who died. And this is what happens every three minutes. I asked 12 kids of the same age than those who died to write with their own hands this extraordinary word, Umashi Menkana. And every three minutes we projected onto these blackboards. So people walk in and they find themselves in this empty space with these blackboards and then suddenly they are filled with this word Umashimenkana We shall bring forth new life When we were getting the blackboards, I also discovered boxes of chalk, of colored chalk that the kids had, had used to write on this blackboard. So I, I requested it, and I created a sculpture in the middle of the memorial, which is a very low, 10 centimeter high plexiglass box, three meters by three meters, and we filled it with the colored chalk. I wanted to create a space of creativity, a space of color, a space of life in the middle of the darkness. Umashimenkana. We shall bring forth new life in Japan. This is Sweden. This is a, a town called Skughal. It was a, a town that did not exist some four decades ago until the largest paper mill in the world came in and created a factory to produce paper. It's called Stura Enso. And so Stura Enso brought thousands of workers and the town was born around the factory. So they had to create habitat for the workers, they had to create a church, a school, a hospital, and the city was born. So today you have 85,000 people living there and the entire economy of, of Skugal revolves around the paper industry. This is a city hall, this is a church, and it's a middle class town. This is how people live. This is one of the areas of the factory, it's absolutely gigantic. They produce an enormous quantity of paper. They own what is called Tetra Pak, which is a paper that is used to make milk and juice cartons. So they, they produce it like this, in this monumental size, and they send it in huge containers around the world. So I was invited by the city of Skugal to do a, a public project. And in my research, I quickly discovered that everything in the city, every public service, every civic entity was created by the paper mill. But something was missing. There was no constal, there was no museum for exhibiting artists. So I, I decided to create a small museum for, for Skugal. 
and I rejected the funding that was offered me to me by, by the city. And I asked the mayor to get me an appointment with the board of directors of the, of the uh, paper mill. And I exposed them my project. I said, listen, you have created this city. Everything here, you did it. So it is your duty to also finance this small constale. They accepted. So we designed and, 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 and built the first paper constale in the world. We combined many layers of Tetra Pak in between these beams of wood also offered by the paper mill. And we built this structure that measures eight meters deep, 20 meters long, and six meters high. The ceiling is paper, the floor is paper, and I left one side wide open so natural light could come in. For the opening exhibition, I invited 15 young Swedish artists to create works related to paper for a paper museum inside a paper town. So this young artist from, from Stockholm created this origami table, offering kids the possibility of creating paper sculptures inside this paper museum. Another did a survey on the phone and asked people of the village, how is it possible that in 30 years you never thought about having a museum, a konstale? And most people said, we are fine like this. We don't need one. But everyone came for the opening. They were curious. We had music from the paper mill orchestra, because they own everything. And people line up all day to enter the Konstale, the Skugal Konstale. This is Leif Bergman, the mayor. He did a very beautiful opening speech. And at one point, he said, well, for me, for you, it might be strange. But for me, it's perfectly natural that this artist from Chile who lives in New York come to Sweden to give us a museum. And this is the moment everyone is waiting. Finally, he cuts the ribbon and people comes in. And like in most openings, you cannot see anything. <laughs> so people visited the, their own first new constale all day. This was uh, by far the most successful work. This is early in the morning. This is in the afternoon. Exactly 24 hours after the opening, we took down the Swedish flag and we did this. Everyone knew I was going to burn it in 24 hours. I just wanted to give them a glimpse of what contemporary art is, and once they had it, to take it away. I was not going to impose an institution to a community that didn't want one. I just wanted to show what it was. And in fact, seven years later, they invited me back as an architect to design the permanent constale of Skogal <laughs> that will open in 2022. Let's go quickly now to Montreal in Canada. This is the center of the town. And as you walk south, you will go through a little Chinatown and reach the cathedral which marks the border between the old and the new Montreal. And the old Montreal is an area, pedestrian, tourist, and uh, 
cafes and boutiques and restaurants. The city invited me to do a project in this building, which is called the Cupola. The Cupola had been the siege of the Canadian Parliament, and it burned. So it was rebuilt because it's a national monument, and it burned again. It was rebuilt a second time, and it burned again. It burned five times. So it was rebuilt because it's a national monument. But after the fifth fire, the, the Canadian Parliament moved to another building. So now it's empty. And they said, what can you do here, Mr. Yar? I went seven times to Montreal to research this project, looking for the essence of the place. It's equivalent to seven floors. Here I'm on the roof of a church, which is 100 meters away. And I realized that the cupola, the, the windows of the cupola, are seen approximately into a radius of, of 15 blocks around, six and seven blocks all around. So it's very visible. On my seventh visit, without any idea what to do here, I was walking back towards the cupola. And I observed a group of men coming out of that van with large boxes of food and vegetable. And so, curious, I approached them. And I saw this inscription on the van. It said, together it is possible to alleviate hunger. So I looked for a sign in the facade to try to understand. And finally, I found this very discreet sign that I had not seen previously. I ring the bell and I discover a homeless shelter, a place where they give food to homeless people three times a day, morning, lunch, and dinner, no question asked. So they told me there are two more shelters in the area. Why don't you visit them? And so I went to see them. This one is at the, bot at the basement of this church, Refuge des Jeunes. Here they welcome 900 kids, homeless, and they give them a locker and a shower for six weeks. And this huge villa, La Maison du Père, the house of the father, where they give apartments to entire families for up to three months until they, they get their lives together. And so I started visiting the three shelters and talking to the homeless people. And they all said exactly the same thing. We are invisible. We go out in the streets. We ask for help. We ask for money. Nobody sees us. We are like a lamppost, a garbage can. What can you do to make us visible? But please, no photography, because I always work with a little camera just as a reference photograph, not to really use them. But they said, no photography. We do not want to be photographed as homeless people. You know, we have our privacy, we have our dignity. So I went home to New York, and I came back two months later, and I proposed a project according to their wishes. But I said, listen, I need your vote. You will vote, and if I get the majority, a yes, we will realize it. And we did. So inside the cupola, we installed 100,000 watts of red lights that when the lights are triggered, the cupola goes red like this for just one second. And I connected this to a device in the three shelters. I'm going to go now inside the shelters, but I'm not going to show you a single human being. And simply, I had a poster here on, 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 on the right of the, of the screen, basically, that shows the cupola, the title of the project, Lumière dans la ville, Lights in the City, and that explains to the homeless people coming in, if you would like your presence to be known outside, just push this button, and the red light will go on and the cupola. And we had the same sign in all three shelters. Lights in the city. This intervention tries to inform society of the daily situation of homeless people. A red flashlight will illuminate the cupola every time like someone like you will push this button. These red lights will be indicating your pre increasing presence in the shelters of Montreal, but at the same time will respect your dignity and your privacy. We want to transform the cupola in a socially painful sign. We will reproduce a metaphorical uh, distress signal visible day and night. Let's hope that we'll be able to change your condition in the shelters of Montreal. And so people come to this area to have fun, dinner, dance, and so on. 
and then suddenly the light goes on, indicating that another homeless person is entering another shelter. We made the front pages of all the newspapers and magazines, and the press descended to this area to talk to the homeless. Suddenly they became human beings. They, they, they interviewed them, they asked them questions. And the younger kids that were homeless, they spent the entire night seated around the bottom and pushing it, so they wanted the light to be on all the time. The other shelters of the city wanted to join us. They want, there were 14 more shelters. They wanted all to be connected and to transform this cupola into the Tower of Shame. But the mayor said, enough is enough. And after six weeks, he turned off the project. Lights in the city, in Montreal. I have two more projects to go. The issue of immigration and, uh, and refugees around the world has, has reached a critical point. We are now at 65 million people searching for a better home around the world. And I've been focusing on this subject for a long time. My last masterclass a year ago was about that. So today I've just brought one of those projects focusing on this issue. And I'm going to show you what I did in Helsinki, the capital of Finland, which is a very beautiful city. where unfortunately these days we have this kind of images. There is a party called the True Finns, now they're called the Finns, that have between 20 and 25% of the vote. That is a party that wants to get out of the European Union, that wants to expel the few refugees and immigrants they have. It's an absurd number. And so when I was doing this project a few years before the so-called immigration crisis that now is striking Europe, I did my research and I realized very quickly by just looking at the city how homogeneous was the Finnish population. So I immediately look at the numbers and I realized that the rest of Scandinavia, Sweden, Denmark and Norway had welcomed a million immigrants in the last 10 years and Finland had welcomed 37. So they have a very restrictive immigration policy. And the reason they give is that for 600 years they were conquered by the Russians and the Swedes. So they have this very um, insular mentality. But at the same time, they were, at the time I was doing my project, they were a candidate to join the EU. So I thought, this is absurd. How can you join the EU and want to become part of the a larger community like the EU, and at the same time you're closing your doors to members of other community. You cannot have it both ways. So based on that, I did a project that required legal help. And I, I was uh, assisted by this extraordinary man, Matty Worry. He was the president of Greenpeace International at the time, but he was also a human rights lawyer. And we fought in court the uh, immigration authorities of Finland, and they allowed us after six months of realizing the project. And the project was called One Million Finnish Passports. And that's exactly what we have here. By contract, I had to put them behind high security glass. And they asked me by contract to burn them after the exhibition without photographing or filming the burning of the passports. I accept it. Why one million? I had calculated that in most European countries, approximately 20% of the population are foreigners or people of foreign descent. At the time, Finland had five million inhabitants. So if Finland had a normal immigration policy like the rest of Europe, they should have had a million immigrants. These are their passports. So it's a very simple gesture. I wanted to tell people, do you want to remain insular or do you want to welcome new ideas, new sounds, new colors? So it's a portrait of the one million new citizens of Finland that are missing in the, in, the, in the country. We did a very subtle lighting with the lighting designer because I wanted people to reflect themselves on the glass and look at these mirrors through their own reflection. 
My objectives were accomplished. We triggered an enormous amount of press and, and there were public discussions in different forums and on TV about why is Finland the way it is. But for me, the most moving reaction was a young Finnish citizen that came in the morning to see the show. He was moved and went back home and came back in the afternoon with his own passport and threw it on top of the pile as a sign of solidarity. After the exhibition uh, lasted around eight weeks and we closed the show and unfortunately because of my contract with the immigration authorities of Finland, I had to burn the passport and could not photograph them or film the burning. But I managed to steal 200 passports. <laughs> and I still don't know what to do with them. <laughs> One million Finnish passports in Helsinki. I will end with this project that I realized a couple of years ago in Dallas, Texas. This is a museum called the Nasho Sculpture Center. It's designed by Renzo Piano, an Italian architect. And it's one of the five top museums in the United States. They have the most beautiful collection of, the, of Giacometti's, for example. And the museum faces a huge garden where they display sculptures of the 20th century and 21st century. This is a Richard Serra, this is a Rodin. Who would have thought that a Rodin and Serra can go together, but here they are. So the museum was celebrated in celebrating its 10th anniversary. And so they invited me to do a project about this. How do we celebrate the anniversary of the museum 10 years after? So in my research, I discovered that it's one of the most extraordinary museum with one of the most extraordinary programs and collections. But I realized that the audience was very limited. Very limited to wealthy people that lives in downtown Dallas where the museum is located. And didn't have enough diversity in the audience. There were no Latinos, no African Americans, no Asian that lived in the, in the periphery of the city because Dallas is a very expensive city. So I told them, I would like to change your audience. I would like to change the demographics of your audience and bring in people to reflect the diversity of Dallas. And so we should celebrate their lives and not the life of the museum. They accepted. So this is Dallas, and this is the location of the museum. As you can see, it's right in the middle, in the center of the city, which is the most wealthy area, an expensive area. And I located all the hospitals in the city. And of those, I located the ones that have maternity wards where children are born, new citizens of Dallas are born. And of those, I selected three. One is known as the African American Hospital. The other one is known as the Latino Hospital. And the third one is known as the Hospital of the Illegals. And so I decided to work with those three. And so I wanted to create a connection between the museum and these new citizens of Dallas being born in these three hospitals. So this is a, a birth room where new kids are being born by these communities that are not represented in the museum. And I created a pavilion inside the garden made of plexiglass and wood. It's a cube that measures seven by seven by seven meters and it's seated in the middle of a pool. And you have to go through a little bridge in order to access the pavilion. And depending on the light, the position of the sun, you can see it more or less, but it integrates very well in the landscape of the garden. Inside, there are just chairs waiting for the audience to come and meditate on the meaning of life in silence. 
The ceiling is also a grid of glass with three accents of green. And hidden in the four corners, we have speakers. And these speakers are connected to the birth rooms of the three ho hospitals. And every time a new citizen is born, we hear in the pavilion their first cries. As you know, it's the moment where we know the child is alive. It's the most important moment for the parents and for the kid. And so we started recording these cries and they played continuously in the pavilion. So you sit there and then you wait for these cries to come up. And they are being recorded in a matrix sound system. And so if the kid is born at 3 p.m. and 15 minutes and 10 seconds, every day at the same time, you will hear the same cry. So they accumulate. And so you enter, you can have some silence or you can have a concert of cries. Of young babies that are, we are listening to their voices at the moment of their birth. And so to the families that participated in this project, we offered them a one-year free membership to the museum. So after the kid is born, they come, they bring their families, their friends, and they sit there to listen to the voice of their kid being born again and again. But to the babies themselves, we offered a lifetime membership. That means that when they will be 15, 20, and so on, we'll have thousands of new members from these communities that are not represented by the museum today in the audience. And hopefully they will affect the direction that the museum will take. So this was a way for me to change the demographic of the institution. And what's important also for me is that these kids, these babies, are entering the museum the first minute they are born. But they're not coming in as spectators. They're coming as artists themselves with their voice as performers. This is a young couple from Iran, and they came to give me the, the voice of their baby that was going to be born a few days later. The mother's name is Ada. The project was called Music. Everything I know, I learned the day my son was born in Dallas, Texas. I will end with these images of a performance that I do periodically around the world. I'm I convert myself in a sandwich board man with this sign that says, teach us to outgrow our madness. It's from a book by Kenza Budoe, Nobel Prize in Literature. It's a book where he speaks to his son and tells him, son, my generation has failed. It's up to you, to the new generation, to help us to change the world, to teach us to outgrow our madness. So this is the performance I did in Brooklyn. So I walk around and like a preacher, I, I tell people, teach me, teach me please, to outgrow our madness. It's a very simple project, but a project with which I identified greatly. And this is how I, I see myself and define myself. I, I go around the world imploring people in languages that I don't know to teach me, to teach me to outgrow our madness. Thank you.